Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. Um, in the first episode, you would have heard Fred talking about skilling himself uh, to talk to executives, as well as learning sixty plus coding languages. And in this um, episode, he starts with how do you establish thinking diversity and create that inculcating a innovation model and a blameless culture. And he also shares very interesting ways. in which how you can be successful five key principles you can be successful in the ai driven world and in it's a great conversation with fred george listen on fred uh, i mean you're talking about the diversity in thought and not just from a diversity i think it's a very pertinent topic given that march month um, as part of software people stories we published five different women uh in technology and all of them from very very diverse background in fact one of them was from marketing all her life she was in marketing one was an investment banker and one was uh, uh in uh, embedded computing then moved to cloud and other was traditionally a hardware engineer went to satellite engineering so uh, i mean more than the being a gender diversity diversity of thought is what spurs innovation i know it is a uncomfortable kind of a conversation initially because you don't understand the culture uh, some cultures are more uh, forthright and some cultures are not so you are sharing the story about your london project can you uh, elaborate on that yes yeah, so when i was in the startup in london that was doing google advertising we had uh, 35 people in 15 countries and and so we we had a very natural diversity there Uh, of different thoughts. I mean, we had some Eastern Europeans. We had obviously some English because it was in London. But we also had, you know, the crazy American like me, who was much older than everybody else, and coming in like that. We had an Austrian who basically was multi-polylingual. He could speak, uh, you know, three different types of German. He could speak French. He could speak Italian. He could speak conversational Japanese. He could speak business Japanese. He could speak uh, Mandarin. He was studying Portuguese and Arabic simultaneously. Uh, we had another guy who basically put the put this military communication system together for Tunisia. Who was also an amazing database programmer. He was so good, Oracle wanted to take him on the road with him. He was he was a MySQL wizard. These are the sort of diversity you had in that sort of organization. Um, now it turns out one of the, one of the interesting stories that we bought another company that was about the same size of us, actually a little bit larger, which was just homogeneous. It was like everybody was English. and there was a very structured hierarchical structure to everything going on and very traditional sort of moving it was actually a it was some sir so i think they had to come with sir somebody or another so he had some english title and so you could think imagine a very hierarchical organization so we when we absorbed that organization we first thing we do is we found everybody who made rules and enforced rules and got rid of them all so we basically wiped out an entire organization part of the organization which was there to make sure that you got their permission to do anything And so what you wind up having is you had people running around saying here I can you sign this off because you know I need this to be signed off to be able to try this idea. Well why why do you got to sign this off? Well I want to make sure that if it doesn't work I don't get blamed for it because you agreed with me. Well all those people that can sign these things off are gone. And so you say well well why don't you go ahead and try it? Well but if I try this before I get fired if it didn't work out. So I don't want to try anything. So it, it took about 6 months for them to sort of get used to the idea that you could actually try something. In fact, one guy got up and said, "I tried this experiment. We're going to do this A-B experiment. We used the two different regions in England to try this experiment. I expected this to have this result. Turns out, I didn't get any result I looked for. In fact, it was a horrible experiment. Nothing worked. And the managing director stands up, says, 'Really good job. Thank you for that.' And everybody's looking at him. Why is he had? Why is he not fired? And they realize that okay, it's okay to have ideas, and they don't work out. Now it turns out, by the end of the first year." we made additional profits by having innovation starting to flow up and having ideas being executed the additional profits from that business pay for the entire acquisition 
just by getting rid of people that ask permission of, let the innovation flow. And that's a lesson I take to heart. It's, if you want to make innovation happen, you got to get rid of the fear. You got to get rid of the, of the permission structures. Uh, and we did that. And we therefore made a lot of money on that. <laughs> very, very funny. I, I can't believe that there are organizations still asking approval for experiments. I, I know that uh, experiments have to be smaller range initially so that you don't inconvenience our customers. Everything. That makes sense. But approvals, okay, that, that is slightly far-fetched. Oh, but but to some degree, anytime you start going to take some time to do something, especially you're going to have to write some code and have to ship something out, but somebody's going to have to say, well, I think it's a good idea. And of course, if they think it's a good idea, they have to make sure their manager thinks it's a good idea. And and so it's going to go, climb up to a certain level of, of conflict. And then they have to sort of prioritize your your experiment versus the other things they have to do. So there's some other things they want to do from a business perspective that here's important. Why should we take time to do your experiment? Well, we may make a lot more money. Well, but you may not make any more money. So you, they're having a discussion. This discussion is a waste of time. We yep. should just go ahead and turn them loose and let them try it. And it's very, very hard to do. Back in the London startup, one of the things we did was the programmers had no managers. So there were no managers for the programmers. And that was oh, probably wow. because the, the things we're working in were, in fact, need to experiment. We're working in fuzzy domains, Google advertising. So since we're working in a fuzzy domain, there's nothing a manager can tell you to do because there's no set of requirements. The idea is make money. What you, what's it going to do to make money? Just whatever you need to try, try something to make money in Google by better Google ads. Try misspellings, for example. Uh, try different languages. Try different texts for your advertising. Experiment, experiment, experiment. And so there's nothing for a manager to tell you what to do. So we didn't have managers for the programmers. They were kind of more self-organizing. In fact, wow. we, we called that we called that programmer anarchy. Uh, anarchy actually, the first definition of anarchy is a team that determines them, that what they want to do themselves. So they self-organize. That's what anarchy actually means. It doesn't mean burning buildings down. That's the number two definition. The first definition is was doing self-determination. There's an interesting book called The Invisible Hook, which is actually a book about pirates and how pirates did their social organizations. Being pirates, of course, there is no uh, go government saying this is what you have to do. So unlike the British Navy, which would have an admiral and, and law officers and get promoted, and you could, if you're a lord, you get to be an admiral yourself. Instead of all these rules, pirates had no rules. And so they were very much self-organizing. In fact, if you're trying to get the boat from one place to another place, there'd be a guy who's very rational about this and make sure the work is allocated fairly and make sure everybody's pulling themselves, do it going that way. Now, when they were going to attack some other ship, though, there's some other wild and crazy guy who's now in charge who's going to do all the crazy things necessary to attack a ship. So they would morph their organization constantly as necessary. And that's what you're really trying to do with your team. You're trying to have the team self-organize itself to sort of react to the situations. Because programming is by nature unpredictable because we're constantly innovating. And so we don't want to sort of lay out, here's the rules for you. Here's what you have to do. Here's your agile process. Here's when you have to have your stand up. Here's how many story points you have to have. Here's where your, where your velocity needs to be. All these things don't make sense in a software development environment. Actually, when you start with, you know, you understand a little bit of those processes. But once you start maturing, I think that's when, you know, you have to create your own processes, uh, able to uh, meet frequently, you know, be able to um, get feedback as quickly as possible. These are basic etic etiquettes that you have to put in place and uh, build on top of that. Well, I actually, I think I, I tend to actually drop processes over time. Initially, when I started engagement, I'll have a, quite a few processes in place because almost all the agile processes are about changing behavior modification or behavior modification for programmers. But once I get that behavior modification done, the process doesn't make sense anymore. I want to drop the process. So I tend, I tend to come out initially in my projects with very, very rigorous, probably almost pure extreme programming, just like the book was originally published. I almost follow that as a Bible. We will do pair programming. We'll have no code written by individuals. We will have stand-ups. We will rotate our pairs. I mean, we do all the ceremony associated with that. We do, we do the retrospectives, et cetera. We do all these things because we want to get the programmers to think differently about how they're attacking the problem. They've been trained in waterfall. They've been putting their headphones on and going off in the corner. And working. I don't want them to be off in the corner. I want them talking to their colleagues. So I have to sort of break down those barriers. Once you break down those barriers, though, the process to break down those barriers is not necessary anymore. So you start seeing these processes being, I drop these processes over time. And that's why I look at, if I look at an organization and everybody's doing agile the same way in all the teams, because that's the rules, you're not agile. Agile yeah. should be different for each of the teams because their problems are different, their maturity is different. 
and their learnings have been different. And as long as there is a foundation of trust and uh, respect, I don't know how to use the word in terms of you know human behaviors and ability to adapt. Right, I think contextually you have to change your own uh, destiny because each team, each pod, if you if you will, have very very different goals. Even if in a large organization which has overall you know increase increase your profitability and all of that, but at a micro team level, all of them have different destinies, right? Yes, and I think it goes back to the I, I sort of work around the five principles around agile. You know, feedback, uh, communication, simplicity, courage, which is I read really is getting rid of the fear and respect, as you said, respect. If you, those are the five principles. Now, how you implement those five principles can be different for your team. But those are the sort of overriding principles. If you get all five of those things running well, programmers are enjoying themselves. We're getting things accomplished. The team is working together. It's when you sort of begin to compromise on those five principles that you create this other problem. Uh, you know, and respect is only one of those. You, you assume your colleagues are doing the right thing. You don't think they're idiots just because they did something that surprises you. Try to understand what they did and why they did it, but treat them with respect. And that sort of goes the other way as well. Treat the treat the executives with respect. You know, they they believe they need to do this thing. Trust that they're making a good decision on behalf of the company. Your job is to try to execute their their plan the best possible. But again, those five principles make sense. I, I have a whole different set of practices I use initially with a traditional program. I have a whole different set of practices I use when I'm doing fuzzy problems. But those five principles, they always are the same five principles. Yep. Those don't change. Those principles really don't change. Having over communication at times of um, problems or more and more feedback. I think somehow uh, we have over a period of time, I feel we have over engineered. I have been, I have been engineered at heart, but somehow I feel we have over engineered agile and uh, that has led to a lot of these blog posts talking agile is dead and all of that, but that's not true. Agility is still needed. Just that uh, some of our practices needs rejigging. Yeah, I think the Dave Snowden, who came up with the Kinevin framework, he's been talking about rewilding things, which is basically how do you turn things back into sort of their original original sense of of experimentation, which the Agile was, was born out of experimentation. Uh, things we learned writing small talk code back in the 80s, even. Um, this is where the Agile con- processes were started. And we've tried to institutionalize these things. And it hasn't helped with having... Uh, Scrum masters, you know, certification saying this is a process you have to follow and here's some rules. I mean, this basically is, has destroyed the agile nature of agile. It's not agile again. If you if you have to write it down, it's not agile. But we, we certainly, I think we need to rewild it. I think, you know, Pitt Beck is, is using new terminology, for example. He's talking about, you know, tidy first, sort of talking about thinking about how to clean up the code with, with various things and sort of how clean do you need to make it before you make the next change? He's not trying to use the agile word because he knows it's been been uh, destroyed in some fashion. Absolutely, I totally agree. In fact, uh, you know, you speak about digital, you speak about you know uh, culture and all of that much better. Um, Fred, one question I I I want to ask: as uh, we grow in our career, uh, typically the sense is you want to go higher up and you want to stop programming. The general sense is once you become a manager uh, or managing uh, multiple teams, people, you want to have some kind of a distance from the programming because many people, there is a general thought that if your hands on the keyboard, in fact, uh, a lot of people use this term called HOK. If your hands on the keyboard, then you're not managerial enough. You're not executive enough. That's the thought process that is prevalent. And uh, I want to understand your perspective because uh, I know you continue to have a love for programming. At the same time, you have a years of the executives. How do you balance this perspective? Well, Sorry if it's a controversial degree, question. To some degree, to some degree uh, the, the fact that you're driven into management is, is driven because that's the way the companies have been organized themselves. You make more money if you're a manager. Uh, now, other companies have decided that's not necessarily have to be true anymore. My brother still works for IBM. Uh, he's 10 years in at IBM. He probably has now 40 years in IBM. He gets executive level pay as a programmer. He's got a program. His, his pay code is an executive code, and he's still writing code. Uh, that's what he does. So that's a company basically decided, yes, 
programmers, especially really, really good ones, we want them to stay programmer. Um, now, it's, it's okay to say I enjoy management more than I like coding. That's pretty okay. Management is a lot of fun. I had built management jobs at IBM. I had over 200 engineers working for me at one point. And being able to slide people around and, and finding the next next person to get get put into management and and organizing the projects. And that was a lot of fun to sort of, you know, stir the pot at a very high level. And it certainly taught me how to, to do it as a, in, in the level. But I still like writing programs. Uh, I still like solving the unique problems. I still like the fact there's something new to learn. And so I choose to spend a lot more time in programming than I would in management. Now, across my career, though, you'll see me dipping in and out of management, almost on five-year cycles. You'll see that I kind of do more management. I, I did a startup in California. I was strictly helping recruit. I was kind of the, the first. I was the developer that was a co-founder. So I, I built the teams up, and then I left. Then I go back into consulting. So I, now I'm writing code, and now I go back. So almost in five-year cycles, I'm coming in and out of management. I, I need. I think I need to dip back in technology every five years at least because it's changed in five years. I need. To, I need to get up to speed of what the latest thinking is. Cloud services and AI and a whole raft of new fuzzy problems we can solve. Uh, it's important to understand what those are before you go back into management. And then I. Then you sort of leave, and then you drip back in there again. Uh, so my career has been sort of little five-year cycles in and out, in and out. Right now, I'm just kind of mostly mostly in the technology side. But my presentation at the conference was, you know, basically a management presentation. When I've talked about sabotaging transformations, it talks about how do I make social changes in an organization. That's a pure management presentation. I mean, uh, my next question was around uh, how do you manage your message? For example, I mean, um, Fred, I, I know your uh, name, it's very popular in the agile community it means that there is a brand behind it right and that has been built uh, by conferences uh, thought papers so to speak how to build that and nurture that while you're balancing your consulting engagement your startups your ventures and all of that how do you really balance that as you i mean have you been doing this for a long time or is it a recent uh, discovery well like i said i've been consulting independently for 35 years, I would say talking to conferences is something that's probably happened in the last 15. And a little bit of that was accidental. I was doing, the, again, doing this startup in London. We wanted to hire programmers. We wanted to compete for programmers, but we're in London. So we're competing with Google, who you know has all sorts of pretty offices. We're competing with the banks who pay obscene, obscene amount of money for programmers. And we want, you know, we want some of the best of the best. So turns out we want, we, we thought we could do that by talking about how we work. The fact we don't have managers, for example. And just we thinking that would appeal to the programmers we want to hire, that sort of concept would appeal to them. Mature programmers who basically feel that they don't need somebody to tell them what to do. They know what to do uh, better than a manager could tell them. So we put a presentation together, talked about that, started showing it to conferences. Sort of a side effect of that was I got famous, being the guy carrying the message around. It was a side effect of trying to get the recruiting done. The recruiting worked very well, by the way. People started finding us because of this. And then when I moved to another company, we talked about, we kept talking about this stuff and they found me again. And then I, you know, eventually when you, even if the thought works, it was like, you know, working on a project with me that you knew you were going to get a chance to sort of basically do what you want to do. Be a programmer, be empowered to do what you need to do. Fred's going to make sure that nobody gets in your way. I will, I will clean, I'll make sure those guys stay out of your way and get your, get your code done. So I think basically when you, when you act when you act like a programmer, that you're not better than anybody else in terms of being a programmer, you're you're one of the people like that, and people want to be around you. I think it's the people that say, oh, "Look, I'm I'm a programmer, I'm the best in the world, and you should come to talk to me and do what I tell you to do because I'm the best." Uh, that doesn't play well with, with the bright with bright programmers. When I did the startup in California, they said, "Well, what's your title going to be? You're going to be vice president of programming, or you want to be the CTO?" I said, "Nope, get that. Don't want that title. Don't want that title." Was a CTO. That's basically saying I'm the chief technology officer. That means I'm going to be smarter than all the other programmers. Uh, I knew who we were hiring. I was not going to be smarter than these guys. These guys were scary. If anything, calling yourself a CTO is just painting a big bullseye on your chest saying, shoot me, because uh, you're, you're going to be smarter than I am. So I, I refused to have the title because I did not want to create that atmosphere that says, yeah, there's some programmer who's supposed to be better than everybody else. I want to build collaboration because I know as a team, we're going to be way smarter than an individual. Now you think about that sort of thing. If you're not care if you don't care about the titles, look at how people hire differently. 
let's say you're in an organization that loves titles. And so you want to get promoted to the next level because that's what that's what the game is. So programmers, we love our games as programmers. So if the game is to get promoted, here's how I, how I get promoted. Well, obviously, you're going to bring somebody in who's junior who's going to push me up the ladder because he's not as good as I am, so he, I'm going to have to be his manager. I'm going to have to be teaching him, and that makes me the manager. That's a higher prestige for me. Well, that's what titles encourage you to do. It encourages you to hire people who are less than you are, so you get pushed. Now flip the model around the other way. Now we have got rid of titles. Now we're trying to solve problems. And the fun thing is solving problems because we're not competing with each other for titles anymore. We're trying to solve hard problems. Well, who do you want to hire? You want to hire the smartest person you can find. But think about it from the company perspective. Do you want to hire the stupid people and promote get people promoted, or do you want to hire the really smart people? Well, you want to hire the smart people, of course. Well, why do you have this hierarchy structure in place which encourages people to hire the, 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 the entry people? Why aren't you encouraging them to hire the really smart people? Yeah, and that's when talent density keeps coming, right? I I read uh, Netflix book about no rules rules. I mean, more and more talented people you have around you, to a large extent, life becomes a lo lot more fun. Uh, when I say talent, not necessarily only in software, right? It could be in business functions. It could be in finance. It could be in HR. Right? Whatever the ta uh, talent area is. I mean, it's more talent you have and uh, some extent it's less political and more work gets done well and i think you want to you want to sort of increase your organization so that you treat the problem you're trying to solve as a bad guy it's not trying to compete with the guy next to me to see if i get promoted first or who's going to get the manager job that creates certainly in the western cultures that i come from that creates a lot of conflict like who's going to get the promotion well i got to make sure i look better than this guy so what do i need to do to make it look better than this guy so all of a sudden, you're thinking about that rather than trying to solve the business problem. If you sort of kill the title concept, kill the titles as being the, as the game you want to play, and change it to being, let's do the fun stuff. Let's ha let's have fun. Let's let's do something novel today. Let's let's solve some problem that never, nobody's ever done before. Let's play with a new technology. See if it works. Certainly, in in when I was working in London, when we had no managers, the Node.js comes out, and they say, well, let's try some some Node.js stuff. And we take some code that was perfectly fine. It was written in Ruby. It was running perfectly fine, making us a lot of money. And they decided we're going to rewrite it in Node. People say, well, why would they do that? They're not going to. It turns out rewriting in Node, we turns out saves us lots of money. But if you had a manager in place, he would say, no, that's not our priority. Our priority is get this other function done. And we were able to do that because there was no manager. There was nobody to ask permission of to try this. And therefore, innovation occurs. And it turns out it was a wonderful innovation. Now, we also had our failures, but, you know, we, we, we try things, they didn't work out, we stopped doing it. And not a big deal, nobody gets blamed, nobody gets fired. And I mean, creating that no fear environment, right? I think that's what uh, makes the life a lot more fun. Uh, and uh, to a large extent, uh, right now, if you look at it, many of the corporates talk about psychological safety in lo long form seminars, long form culture. I mean, I, sometimes I, I find myself saying, okay, psychological safety doesn't come by seminars. It's by action. Show it that you have safety rather than, you know, by saying I am a psychologically safe organization. Yeah, but you also got to encourage, encourage that communication. Um, certainly when you have a team, get a team together, you're going to have some people that are going to be talking more than others. And so as, when you're leading teams like that, you have to sort of make sure the quiet people get a chance to say things. And so I will explicitly call them the quiet people first, because I know the people that are going to talk all the time will always say something. I want I want the ideas out of the quiet people. Uh, so I basically am trying to empower them to speak, and and they can they can say that. And and if if they sort of seem to get attacked by other people, I would make sure they don't get attacked. You know, I'm trying to create that environment that says, try it. Oh look, it works. You can say something. Feel comfortable saying that. And I see sometimes, you know, I see a, a gender a gender bias as well in some of the companies I work with, in some of the regions I work with, where the men start talking and then the women shut up. And you you sort of really have to fight that. You have to sort of, you know, drag the women back up to say, you know, talk. And by the way, tell the men to shut up and listen, because by the way, they have some good ideas. And the, but they, they want to say, oh, no, I have a, no, no, shut up and listen. They have a, they have a really good idea. But you see that as you, and that's, again, as part of the team training. Sort of break through the, some of those stereotypes. But yeah, psychological safety is basically make sure the quiet people get a chance to speak. You don't worry about the noisy people. They always talk. They're, they're not, they have no they have no qualms. Let's we'll start with the quiet people. Um, I just realized that uh, we've been talking for um, some time and uh, 
I, it's such a such a bliss to talking to you, Fred. Um, wanted to um, ask one question. If you and re rewind ten years from now, what would the software landscape look like? Have you imagined yourself, uh, you know, thinking that? And uh, would you like to share some? Where are we heading towards? Are we heading towards no code, no estimate, and no low code, no estimates? smaller teams doing their own thing faster where do you think all of this is heading because this is my sort of uh, you know utopia if you will but want to understand what is your utopia looking like i don't really look 10 years in advance because it's hard to sort of guess what that is but if you if you said look into a crystal ball i think you'll see the same trend we have in the last 10 years and that is uh, programmers are spending more time solving problems and not not wrestling with computers and that's somewhat, you know, I look at a language like Kotlin uh, and the ability of what we do there, we can deploy it in the cloud. Uh, all these sorts of things make it easier for us to spend time solving problems, not doing a lot of other clerical activities. I can remember back in, go back to the 1970s, change control was actually going into a deck of cards that we had racks of, figure out what the line number is we wanted to change and say, okay, here's a card that replaces this line number with these other two line numbers. And you punch that on the computer card and stuck it in the deck. Uh, a, lot, a lot of clerical work that right now I just push into GitHub. He figures out all these change things for me. So I think it's going to be things like uh, the tools are going to get better. Uh, the AI, AI support of these tools means all the routine stuff is going to be easier to be done. It'll just do it for us. And it's going to, programmers are going to be people who are successful programmers are the ones who have the conceptual skills. I can see the problem. I can tear the problem down into its essence. And I and I can therefore tell tell the, the tools to go build that little essence for me. One of my favorite examples is imagine you're modeling a little, a little girl sitting in a lemonade stand selling lemonade, and you're trying to model that system. Well, you would first of all say, well, I'm going to model the girl, I'm going to model the lemonade pitcher, and then some lemons and some mixture to make that up, and she's also going to you know serve the, do do the change and everything. So she's going to have a lot of roles. That's not the right way to model it. Conceptually, you want to think, well, there's somebody who's worried about money and taking money and getting money back. There's something about, you know, making lemonade. Well, how about the pitcher making its own lemonade? How about the pitcher is able to be smart enough to make itself when it gets low? So it's having some third party do that. And so you begin to break down the roles of what you're doing into the essence of what you're trying to solve the problem with. Now you want a bunch of parts that work for the girl and selling lemonade, but also work for a vending machine. That it understands how to make money and understands how to make new drinks and understand these are elements of the same thing. I can reuse these parts. So a conceptual thinker can look at that girl in lemonade and say, it's not, we're not modeling a girl in lemonade. We're modeling making lemonade, making money, changing things, deciding all the, we're modeling all these other fundamental concepts. So programmers who can sort of break things down conceptually like that are going to be very successful regardless of the tool set. The tools are going to make it easier to be a programmer to sort of do the, the stuff that's basically the grunt work. I hate worrying about semicolons. I hate worrying about well, or curly braces. I don't want to worry about that solely nonsense. I'm trying to solve a problem, uh, get out of my way. So I think that's kind of, I think that's where it's going to go. We're going to have better and better tools for that. That means if you're if you're just a clerk, you're, if you are if you think programming is something you learned in school and you don't have to change, your, change it anyway, you're going to still be a programmer doing the same thing you're doing today, you'll be out of a job. Uh, you better be one of those people that's continually investing in your own learning. You better be the person that's trying out these, some of these new tools. You better be the person that maybe even trying out different sort of companies to work with. But you better be investing in yourself. Otherwise, yeah, you should move into management because, yeah, we are going to need you as a programmer. You're going to be out of date. That is very, very powerful. First is, uh, you know, focus more on programming than clerical. Go to the essence of the problem. I mean, the essence could be um, what is seen in the eye, but uh, you it, you also go deeper and uh, skill uh, oneself, right? Continuously skill because <laughs> unless you skill yourself, you're not going to, uh, you know, suddenly get a uh, better understanding of how do you solve for it. Because what uh, helped me uh, learn Kotran uh, 25 years back is not going to help me in any way today. I mean, <laughs> I can probably, uh, the only way is I can probably say that's one of the languages I learned, but is that going to really win anything? Nothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wrote, I, wrote 10, I wrote code in 10 years for an assembly language. I mean, we were, had 16 registers on IBM 360, and you would put the return address in, in, in register 15, and you could therefore branch through register 15 back to where you came from. And you're like, 
Uh, and we had to worry about that. That's the things we worried about as programmers. I don't worry about that anymore. <laughs> I don't care what's in register 15. Uh, I don't even care there's registers anymore. I, I'm solving higher, higher level problems. And I think Excellent. that trend will continue. Yeah. Excellent, Fred. Uh, any uh, advisors you want to share apart from continuing to skill yourself? continuing to reinvent yourself. Any advice that you want to share for our listeners? I, I think you also want to look at the companies you work for. Working for a company that is using your software internally is different than working for a consultancy, which is running company code for somebody else. A startup is much different than, say, an IBM or a big big company. The more you have experience across all those, the better off you're going to be because they, there's several ways of thinking about each of those situations. So I would say when you think about making that job change, don't make the job change just to get a different language. Also think about the environment you're dropping yourself into, the startup versus the established company, the consultancy versus the in-house uh, tool, tool building. These are radically different problems to solve and you solve them differently. So get yourself exposed also to different sort of companies and their attitudes. And basically, if it's not fun, get another job, try something else. Programming should be fun. Uh, if it's not fun, please walk away, find, find, find another company to work for. Thank you so much, Fred. I think that's the most fun I've had in talking about programming and software and uh, people associated with it. Um, really, really appreciate your time. I know it's very late for you uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, today actually happens to be 23-4, uh, you know, April uh, 5th. So two, three, four, five. So I just realized that when the but time it's, popped it's up. Only, it's only April 4th here. <laughs> You're, you're talking about tomorrow. You're in the future already. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had fun and uh, please stay in touch. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people's stories. If you like this episode, Please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.